need to make one was both surgical left, but Audrey Kimball was the lady that passed away this past week. Uh, Audrey would have been a, da a daughter or two in the Stitt family, that so came in Catholic Stitt. So uh, it was less than a year ago I did her husband's from John Street. So Audrey has passed away. I'm sure that the family would appreciate your prayers for them. The other thing I want to share with you that I mentioned the Claude Tiffany family, that the family is going to be using the church for an hour Tuesday for a visitation for the Great Life Service. Many of you will probably remember Ashley and PJ and some of the family, those will be nieces and nephews of uh, Claude. So we need to keep that thing in our prayers. But if you see some cars and things here too, then that's what's going on with that. Okay. Revelation chapter 2. I don't know what the Desi or Robin's going to be, of course. Let's see if John can share with us. church in Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan has <coughs> Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that, so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give the person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Amen. <coughs> Jack and Gregor work at a factory, but Jack and never get to uh, work on time. And one day the boss came out to him and said, Jack, do you know when we start working here? He said, no, because everybody's already here when we get here. Well, we've got to do something about being late. So I want you to think of some ideas that we might be able to do to, so that you won't be late for work. And he said, how about the last person in will to listen? There are compromises all over the place. Uh, one of the things I think that, and we'll read about most churches here in the book of Revelation, that that's the one thing that Jesus looked at them and says, you've compromised the truth. And all of us are guilty of doing that. Okay? For whatever purpose it is, that he wants us to know that this is a very serious, serious problem. In fact, the compromise of holiness in the church is a whole lot worse than any persecution that we put toward the church on the outside. That what we see happening in our world today is that continuing compromise. Um, I can tell you more stories about that when I go into it right now. But when we look at the church of Pergamon, it's going to be kind of the same outline that we see for most of the other churches, that Jesus is going to share with them what they're doing right, what, what he's pleased with, and then he's going to share with them where they are failing at. Okay? So we're going to start here with the fact that what Jesus approves of here in the church. And the question is, first of all, how does Jesus describe himself in these verses? Anybody? He's the son of man. Oh, I'm sorry? He's the son of man. Okay. Thanks. And what else? The sword. Okay. So the spirit, and you say a two edged sword, we're going to talk about that. How does he. Did you turn your mic off? I think we're out of back. charge of changing the batteries. Oh wait, I am. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll get through. I'm sorry. I did not even realize it turned green and now it's turned red. So maybe God is telling me to quit. <laughs> no. Okay. So what, what we see here, he uses the idea of a two-edged sword, which is what? 
It's the sword of the spirit. It's, it's the word of God. It, it's going to be in its two ends because it cuts both ways. I don't know if you remember a, a movie by Rambo. We're not going to get into all of that right now. But when the enemy asks him, who are you? His answer is, your worst nightmare. Okay? If I'm a Christian, and the word of God is, is being used in my life to purify me, it's the greatest thing that could ever happen. But if I'm not a Christian, and we see the word of God striking out and convicting us, that's the worst nightmare that we can experience. So it's a double-edged sword. It's going to go both ways here. And it's the one thing that he describes himself as because... He is who he is, and, and that this word, the truth, is going to come to the church of Pergamum if they don't repent, if they continue to reject what he wants them to be. So how does Jesus describe the church here at Pergamum? teaching of um, Balaam. Okay. Holding to the teachings of Balaam. And there's another group that he mentions here, a little hard to pronounce maybe, Nicolaitans. Okay. 
Balaam is very obvious what's going on there. If you look at Numbers chapter 22 through 24, that's the story of Balaam. And what happens, Balaam, the, the head of this country, is afraid of the Israelites. He wants Balaam to come and to curse them, but he can't do it because God stops him. You ever heard of a donkey talk? Anybody? That's where it happens. Okay, the Balaam's upset and the donkey, he's beating the donkey, and the donkey says, what do you get me for? I'm trying to have it happen. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the donkey talks. But what happens is, what Balak wants to happen here, he wants the people of Israel to intermarry, to become sexually immoral, and get so mixed up with these people that they lose their holiness. It's exactly what the world is wanting us as the church to do. It's that very thing. And read the story. Balaam doesn't want to do it. God stops him twice. Why does he finally do it? Anybody know? He offered him more money. And all at once, because of the offer of the money, he is now going to do what Balaam wants him to do. And, he, and Israel becomes very, very infiltrated as far as the unholy people, the, the influences. And that's what happens. That's what happens. So he tells them that some of them are practicing Balaam. But see, our, our view sometimes is that not, no, no, not everybody's doing that. So what's the big deal? Right? That we're just going to, we're going to talk more about this in Thyatira tire next week. It's okay. We'll just pretend like it's not going on. Most of us aren't doing that. So we'll just live and let live. And Jesus said, no. There's the old story about the, the guy that he's preaching, and I, I forget where I heard him preach at, but he says, you know, if you're driving down the road of life and Satan wants a ride, don't pick him up because eventually he's going to be driving. That when we allow him to come in, you know, it, it just gets me over and over again that we look at evil in the world and how many times have we heard this story about containing evil. You can't. You can't. You can't do it militarily, economically, politically, or religiously. That when you let evil in, it's going to continue to spread. In Corinthians, Paul says that a little bit of yeast affects the whole loaf, doesn't it? Once it's allowed to come in. Jesus is looking for his church to be holy, and these people, just a small group of them, aren't. Okay? So what are you supposed to do about that? And Jesus' big word is, you better repent. Okay? That we may take our sin very lightly, but he doesn't. We may think that we can just skirt by God and with the sinfulness in our life. He doesn't. And he says to them, you better Think about what's going on. And not only, folks, listen carefully, not only does he look at those people that are committing those sins, he's looking at the people that are allowing it to go on to. That those that tolerate it, those that, that don't separate them and, and put them, and, and you know, not to go to destroy them, but to cause them to repent. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. And then the Nicolaitans, it's, it's a little bit harder to even read about them. If I say the word libertine, what does that mean to you? Liberty means freedom, okay? And that's where they, the, the name comes from. And the idea is here is that God doesn't care what you do because it's only your spirit that he's concerned about. So it doesn't matter if you're sexually immoral. It doesn't matter if you lie, cheat, steal. And it's your spirit. And there are some Eastern religions that get into this idea that the worse you treat your body, the higher you treat your spirit. You know, there, there's so much here, folks, that we can't go into. But what we're looking at in our world today are people that have a completely different mindset than the Christian. Okay? That's why the whales and the, all these animals are so important. They put man on the bottom of the pole, not on the top. My Bible tells me that, God, that men, humanity, is the crown of creation. And their whole mindset is different. So that's when you see the burning coals where people walk over the burning coals. Why? Because the worse you treat your body, the more you're treating your spirit. But my Bible tells me that my body is what? As a Christian. It's a temple. It's a place of worship and holiness. Okay? So Jesus looked at the Nicolaitans and says, it's a dangerous thing that they're telling you. And there's another group that is including that called the Gnostics. And the word Gnostic means to know. And boy, don't we have them around here in our world today. Those who are in the, quote, Christian world, end quote, that will tell you that they have a special word from God. I heard one TV preacher, a very famous one, 
that one day speaking said, don't worry about what the Bible says, just listen to what I say. Wow. One of the top <coughs> okay, in our, our TV land. Okay? So they claim to have the special knowledge that nobody else has. And that's, you know, God told me this. And you got to understand that it's the truth and getting people involved in all of these things. Beware of the twisting of Scripture. Beware of the tolerating and the compromising of God's Word. That is what Jesus is saying to the church there. That the church is corrupted. When the world comes in and, and starts making its mark in the church, Jesus said that's a very serious crime here. It's not something that we just allow and push it to the side and put our head in the sand and decide that we're going to pretend like it's not there. It's there. So what is happening is that we're trying to reinvent the church. We're trying to revive the church by making concessions to the world. Oh, you can't do that. Okay. There's a, a video that I watched, and if you have YouTube, uh, Randy, we're going to probably watch it one of these months with the guys. It's from Bob Russell, who preached in uh, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. Or, I'm sorry, Lowell, Lowell Kentucky. <coughs> and it's about David and Goliath. And he makes the, the whole message is about <coughs> sacrificing and concessions we're making to the world. And that when David says to Goliath, I'm going to cut your head off so that you will know that there is a God in Israel. You know what the next thing that David does, the scriptures say? Small little sentence there that I never paid attention to before. He <coughs> says that David ran toward Goliath. Folks, what I see in the church today, we're running away from the world. We're, we're making concessions, we're giving in, we're giving up in many ways. And we may think that's okay. We may think that's okay in many ways, but Jesus doesn't. That the lines are blurred so badly, so badly, <coughs> that we try to reinvent the church. We're trying to change it, make it different. But what happens is that our culture has a more greater imprint on many people than the church does. That we see things through the eyes of the world and, and all at once that we, we see that things are changing and we think that we've got to change to get through. That we tolerate our own sin. We tolerate the sins of others. And we're afraid to say anything. If I see my brother in Christ or I see anyone that's living in this life of sinfulness, how can I not say something? How can I just let them? Because we don't want to be called a big deal. Okay, we don't want to call this or that. Okay? So what Jesus is trying to get us to see that when we allow that sin to remain in our life, Satan will never be content until he controls us. He's never going to be content until he has complete possession of us, and he'll keep doing this, and doing this, and doing this. There was a, a man, his name was Dr. Howard, he was from Australia, and he was speaking one time on sin, and he was very, very graphic about the sin and corruption of people. And some of the leaders of the church came to him and said, please don't do that again. You want to call it mistakes? And, and we're pretty good at that, right? We're only human. It's just a mistake. All this kind of stuff that we use to excuse the sin in our life. But, but don't do that anymore because if you're talking to people that way, then they're more likely to become sinful. I'm not sure what that logic is. So Dr. Howard says, you understand what you're telling me to do? He said, he took a bottle out of a death there and that's what it said. And he said, you see underneath the bottom of that label, what does it say in bright red? Poison. Okay. So what you're asking me to do is take the label off of that poison and put something like the essence of peppermint or, or something like that on it. Call it something else. But you see, the, the statement that he was making them is the, the milder you make the label, the more dangerous is the poison. Sin is poison. We, we treat it like it's something that's not that bad. And it's a rattlesnake that's ready to, to destroy us. But we allow it to remain, for whatever reason it might be, because maybe we just lower the standard. Maybe it doesn't make us feel guilty. Maybe I don't have to look at the sinfulness of my life and, and have that desire to become holy. 
maybe I don't have to allow the Spirit of God to work in my life to make me holy, that I can just be content down here. The problem is that Christians are being corrupted. Just think for a few moments. How much time did you spend last week watching TV as opposed to reading your Bible? How much time did you spend last week watching TV uh, compared to serving or, or praying or helping your neighbor, those types of things? There, there is very little in our world today. And, and in fact, that's what I tell young people who are getting married. You know that everything in this world today is going to try to destroy you. They're going to try, and that's what he's doing to us. That we are allowing things into our lives that are going to corrupt us, but we don't seem to care. We're okay with that. Everybody does that. Everything is okay that we, we don't catch what is really going on with all we're going through. And so we have we blurred the lines between the world and Christianity. We can't tell the difference between Christians and non-Christians. A recent Gallup poll, I don't know, it was taken just a couple of years ago that the moral standards between Christians and non-Christians are almost non-existent. That, that it, there's no difference between the two. How can that be possible? How can that be possible that you can't tell the difference between the Christians and the non-Christians? Right? There well, there's a story I'll tell you otherwise. I'm not going to do it from the pulpit here. There was a, a lady that was sitting at a stoplight, and there was another car in front of her, and there was, it was a red light, so the lady in front of this lady is going through a bunch of papers in her car. Okay? So she's not paying attention to the traffic light. So the light turns green, and they just sit there. Because she's still going through those papers, and the light turns red again. Okay? So the lady that's sitting behind her doesn't say too much at that moment, but it happens again. The light turns green, then it turns red, and she starts she rolls her window down and just starts yelling at this person. Okay? So about 10 or 15 seconds into her yelling at this person, a police officer walks up <coughs> and says to her, ma'am, you'll have to come with me. And she said, well, you can't arrest me for just yelling. He said, ma'am, you need to come with me. Took her into the police station, left her in a room for a while, and about a half hour came back, told her she's free to go. So why in the world did you bring me in? Well, ma'am, you were sitting there yelling all kinds of words, obscenities. I saw all the Christian symbols on the back of your car, and I figured you stole them. What happens when our language is that of the world and not of Christ? What, what, what happens when our thoughts and our actions are like the world and not the way that Christ would want us to be? Jesus is saying to us that we need to repent of that. To, to compromise. You know, compromise is so subtle, isn't it? That it's just a little by little. Okay? For, for example, uh, I can show you uh, quotes from all the religious leaders of the Protestant, Catholic religion, both, about their view of certain doctrines that are absolutely correct in Scripture. That their churches for miles away. What happened? Just little by little, you see. It just sneaks in and sneaks in. Okay? And that we are taken by that. Okay? Sometimes we don't even recognize what's going on, and sometimes we don't recognize it until it's too late. But this isn't what we were taught, and sometimes we're taught things aren't quite true. But biblically, it doesn't change. It doesn't change at all. So the compromise becomes very small, a little bit at a time. And finally, you veered off. You know, there was a, a missile that was launched on the eastern seaboard several years ago, and it was designed to go over Los Angeles, California. And they were one thousandth of one degree off, and it ended up going over Portland, Oregon. It's just very, very slowly we just go to the side. Kind of like the story I saw the other day. This man and a woman are driving down the road and they have an accident. Tolls their car, but they're not hurt. So they get out of the cars, and the lady says, look at this car. And the guy says, yeah, mine's total too. And she says, you know, but we're not hurt. That must be a sign from God that we need to be friends. 
well, yeah, that sounds good. That's, and she said, you see, what else? That my car is totaled, but I have a bottle of wine in the front seat that was not harmed at all. I think we should drink it, celebrate, that we won't hurt. So she gets the wine out, she gives it to the man, he opens it up, he drinks about half the bottle. Gives it back to her, she puts the cap on, hands it back to him. Says, you're not going to drink any? No, I think I'll just stand here and wait for the police. <laughs> but we can be deceived and not realize what's going on. And that's what's happening to us. But I, I look at our society, and, I, and I'm not talking about just the Christians, but our society. <laughs> just things happening that I can just see. And just go on slide down. Just a little bit more. Okay? I was at a, a situation, I'm not going to get into all of that, uh, and was talking to these people, and uh, this guy says that he had to go and do a wedding. And he wasn't able to stay. And I said, oh, who, who's that? And he gave me the names. He's marrying two men. And I know of some good people that attend the church. I asked them, how, how, how do you justify that? Because we're just lowering the standard all the time. All the time. And that we need to wake up and realize what's going on. Because our salvation is there in jeopardy of what we're going through. There's the, the great sword that took the horse. The Greeks had tried to conquer Troy for 10 years. And one of their big, big heroes was a guy named Achilles. And Achilles had died, and, and he, the people didn't want to keep fighting. But Odysseus was a, the leader of this group. And he decided that he would get, make this huge horse, leave it outside the gates of the city. And they, they settled off like they were people. And he thought it was some kind of gift that they were getting, so they pulled it inside, except who was in the Trojan horse? All the Greek soldiers. And at the nighttime, they'd come out of the horse, open up the gates, and the Greeks had sailed back, and they conquered Troy from where? <coughs> inside. Inside. Well, I don't, I don't know that we need to look at the outside of persecution of that. I can give you a strong argument that in the times of persecution, the church actually grows. The people respond to that, but from inside. Because it's really, really hard to look at someone that's doing something false when it's my friend. When somebody that I've known for a long time. It's really difficult in the inside because that we don't want to approach them in the way that we need to. Steve, if you look at your field, Look like that. We'll go with the first one, won't we? Okay. We're in church. You're supposed to say that first one, Joe. That's what I That's what the church looks like. If we keep the church holy, it looks this way. But once we start compromising that holiness, then we're going to see the weeds come up. We're going to see all kinds of, of struggles that are going to come up that were never intended for that. It's a lot better to prevent than it is to cure. It's a lot better to be holy in the beginning than it is to have to go through all the, the effort to get sin out of me. Because when I allow Satan to come in, and I can, the Holy Spirit can drive him out, but there's going to be scars. He's not going to let go without a terrible fight in our lives. And Jesus forgives the guilt, but there's times the consequences are going to remain there for a long time. Because you see, compromise eventually leads to judgment. It is King Saul. It is a good story to, to see, illustrate what God is trying to tell us. He's the first king of Israel. It's who the people wanted. You'll have to read that because I think it's an interesting conversation there because they say we want a king. God says, well, you know, because here's what's going to happen if you get a king. Oh, we've got to have a king. Okay? So Saul becomes king, and for a while things are going okay, but then he oversteps his bounds three times. Three times. And the last time he does that, he is supposed to destroy the Amalekites and, and to kill the king, but he doesn't. He doesn't. And he comes back, and Samuel meets him there and says, God has ripped the king away from you because of your disobedience. And you know what Saul says? I obey the Lord. Well, how come I hear these sheep making noise, these cows moving? You're supposed to destroy everything. And here's the king right in front of you. 
So when that confrontation takes place, it is Saul that is more concerned about his appearance before the people than it is about his heart with God. Because he says to Samuel to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, your God. Oh, there's peace. That Saul just kept sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing until that judgment would come upon him. What did he was wanting to do? change of 